Hello everybody and welcome to today's devotional. Quick thought for you today, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul starts out here in the first couple of verses describing the gospel that Paul taught included the resurrection of Jesus. He says in verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. So uh, what's going on, as we're going to see, is there are some who are teaching in Corinth that there is no resurrection or will be no resurrection of the dead. Whether or not this was a an attempt to combine a Sadducean type of viewpoint of the Old Testament with the New Testament with the law of Christ or some kind of hybridization uh, like that, I don't know. But what we do know is that there are other occasions of issues regarding the resurrection, even among some who once were Christians. Hymenaeus and Philetus would come to mind as Paul warned Timothy about Hymenaeus and Philetus who taught that the resurrection was already past, uh, suggesting again that there would be no ultimate resurrection of the dead. But Paul here describes this gospel that these brethren received and in which they stand, by which they're saved, if they hold fast the word that was preached to them. And this is a great example to show that what we believe certainly has an impact on our salvation and the fact that obviously these are individuals who had been saved, they had had their sins washed away uh, through baptism, and there was still the potential of them losing their salvation if they did not hold fast the word that they were taught, uh, which goes to show that once saved, always saved doesn't exist as far as the gospel is concerned. Verse 3, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve, and after that he was seen by five hundred brethren at once, and then by James, and then in verse 8, by me also. So he's describing the process of events in which there is evidence, there's proof, there's eyewitness testimony that Jesus, as was prophesied according to the scriptures, that Jesus was raised from the dead. 500 brethren at one time saw him raised. Some of them had died, Paul says, of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep or have died. So then he picks back up here in verse 12. Now, if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? Remember, the Sadducees did not believe in a spiritual realm. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in the resurrection. Matthew 22, that was kind of one of the main uh, components of the Sadducees asking the question of Jesus about the woman. And she was married to a man who had six other brothers. She ended up being all seven men's wife because each one died not having born children. And they ask Jesus in the resurrection, whose wife will she be? And of course, Jesus says, you do err, not knowing the scriptures and the power of God. But the component here, what, what we're told by Matthew is that the Sadducees did not believe in angels. They didn't believe in the resurrection. Uh, they didn't believe in a spiritual realm. And so their entire viewpoint, their worldview as it pertained to the law and the prophets, the prophecies regarding the Messiah, it was extremely focused on the physical kingdom of Israel. It was extremely focused on the here and now, this world, not the world to come or the spiritual realm. And again, whether or not that has anything that there's that that had any influence on those among the Corinthians who were teaching that there is no resurrection of the dead, or if this was like Acts 17, where even those at the Areopagus that Paul uh, preached to at Mars Hill, as soon as they heard about the resurrection of the dead, they scoffed and uh, they, they couldn't really grasp the, the, their minds around the idea of being raised from the dead. And so it's possible that this is just uh, even a, a Gentile influence that there is no resurrection of the dead. But what's interesting about this is the insistence that Paul makes regarding the resurrection of the dead. But notice he says, how do some among you say 
that there is no resurrection of the dead. Notice they're not saying that Jesus wasn't raised. That's not what they're saying necessarily. I, I think that they aren't saying that Jesus was never raised from the dead, but I think they're suggesting that we will not be raised from the dead. Um, Hymenaeus and Philetus, for instance, as they were preaching that the resurrection was already passed, whether that was specific to Jesus's resurrection, and so they applied the resurrection as being specifically about Jesus. There's not going to be a resurrection of, of everyone at the last day, or maybe they were taking it in a kind of a spiritual sense that when we're raised in baptism, that's our resurrection. Regardless, how many of I lead us, we're not teaching the truth about the resurrection of the dead. But Paul says in verse 13, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And to me, this is the point that Paul makes in verse 13, is that there, these two views are contradictory to one another. They're exclusive to each other in the sense that if you can't believe that Jesus was raised from the dead and then not believe in the resurrection of the dead, in fact, at the very the same example in Acts chapter 17, remember at the end of Acts 17, when Paul says that uh, God has appointed a day on which he's going to judge everyone by the man whom he's raised from the dead, he's proven, he's given assurance that that would happen, uh, that that day of judgment would take place by raising Jesus from the dead. So you, you can't believe, though, that Jesus was raised but that there won't be a resurrection of the dead. And that's what Paul's showing here, is that there's a contradiction in the their logic and their consistency of belief. Then in verse 14, he says, if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is empty. So all the efforts that those who taught the gospel, including the apostles, there, there was no promise. It's empty. There was no value. There is no... Uh, no hope in what they taught. It's just empty words. And therefore, their faith, their conviction has no promise. It has no value. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up if, in fact, the dead do not rise. Paul, I believe, specifically addressing the apostles here. Obviously, anyone else who uh, certainly saw Jesus raised could be considered it certainly would testify, or I would hope it testify that Jesus was raised. But specifically when Paul says we, he talks about the, he's talking about the apostles, those who are going about and teaching and preaching specifically in the Great Commission as Jesus called on the apostles to be, to bear witness that, that he was risen from the dead and to, to teach all things that, that they had been taught by Jesus and so forth. But when he says we have been found to be false witnesses, this isn't just we're accidentally telling something that's not true false witnesses was it was deliberate it was deliberate it was um a malevolent act to bear false witness it was something you knew full well was a lie yet you did it anyway and that's what paul's saying it's not just that well we were honestly mistaken if if this is the case no we are found to be false witnesses all the apostles are liars if in fact Christ did not was not risen, uh, and thus the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. It's interesting, Paul re-emphasizes this point to stress to these brethren, you cannot believe both of these things. You can't believe Jesus was risen, but that there is no resurrection of the dead at the last day. That those two, those two are contradictory to one another. If one is true, then the other is. If one is not true, then the other can't be true. If there is no resurrection of the dead, that means Christ isn't risen. And if Christ isn't risen, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Your faith has no purpose. It's futile. There's no reason for it. And in fact, if Christ isn't risen, remember uh, Peter uh, tells us in 1 Peter chapter 3 that baptism, as he says, doth now save you. And then as he goes on to say in verse 22, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the 22 and 23, uh, through Jesus Christ uh, and the resurrection from the dead. That's what gives uh, baptism its power to forgive sins, is through the resurrection of Jesus. So if Christ is not risen, we could be baptized, but it wouldn't do anything. It wouldn't take away sin. 
because it wouldn't have that power to forgive sin. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ, those who have died in Jesus, faithful servants of God, have fallen asleep and they've perished and they're gone and there is no hope for them. Which is to say that all those who have been faithful, if Christ hasn't come back by the time we've died, we've missed it. Sorry. What was, what was the point of having faith? What was the point of believing then? If there is no afterlife, if there is no spiritual realm, no day of judgment, no heaven, then what's the point? What's the point of anything? If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. Uh, most, most apply this specifically regarding the apostles. If in this life only we have hope in Christ. But uh, I think verse 19 is connected to verse 17, 18. All of us, anyone who proclaims to be a Christian, anyone who puts their hope in Jesus Christ, if in this life only we have hope in Christ and we can't have hope for him or have hope in him for our spiritual life, for that life to come, we are of all men the most pitiable. Certainly those who are teaching, teaching and preaching the apostles, for instance, would be the most pitiable in the sense that they had given their entire lives and committed and even given themselves over to persecution and even death for something that has no hope. But certainly all Christians, I think, would, would fit into this category. So then in verse 20, he says, now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, which is to say he's the first one to be risen, never to die again. And no one has before or since Christ been risen, never to die again. Only at the last day will that happen. Now, having said all of that, there is a lot of push within the religious realm to associate or try to connect some sort of physical kingdom to the promises of God. There is the, the Zionist judaistic view that still holds that the messiah hasn't come yet that he will and that israel be, will be reestablished as it was under the kingdom of solomon and th that'll be the the fulfillment of the, the promises that god made there's those like those who follow mormonism uh, one of the core components core tenets of mormonism the book of mormon is that the new Jerusalem would be on earth, that it would be a physical city. And Joseph Smith was claiming to where he settled, that's where the new Jerusalem is gonna be built. First it was in Missouri, and then eventually they moved it out to Utah with Brigham Young and so forth. There are several different quote unquote Christian religions that have established physical kingdom components to them. But I think it's interesting that that's the very thing that Paul is warning about here. Yeah, I know his focus is on the resurrection of the dead, but what does that mean? How is that? How would that then be applied, for instance, with verse 12? There is no resurrection of the dead, and yet they believe in Christ. The only application I can think of is that they were believing in a physical kingdom and a physical fulfillment of the promises of of basically heaven on earth type of thing. That's the only way that verse 12 that they could that I can I can imagine trying to justify or or reconcile in my mind believing that Jesus was raised from the dead but not believing that one day all will be raised from the dead. But it's interesting to me that there is this effort and and certainly it's not isolated just to Judaism or Zionist or uh, Mormonism, but this push, this desire to believe in heaven on earth, that the new heavens and the new earth will be physical. And in a lot of ways, I, I wonder if the motivation for that, first of all, is because A, the physical is what we know. Okay, we don't know what the spiritual world is like. We've never encountered that before, and in, in, in our experience can't really comprehend what that realm is like. And so for a lot of people, that can bring about fear. And so in an effort to try to not fear it, they make it something that they can relate to. That's the physical. 
And, and so some efforts may be to try to make it something that I don't have to be afraid of because I know what the physical world is like. And, and so heaven on earth, everything's like the Garden of Eden. Everything's great and good. And, and that's what I want. You know, I want food at my fingertips and I want you know, not have to pay any bills anymore. And I don't have to, to, to work a nine to five job all the time. And you know, that sort of, of mentality that, that some people might have. Then others, it may be an effort to, in some ways, try to, to twist the concept of judgment. Because if there is not gonna be a resurrection of the dead at the last day, and that eliminates the need for a quote unquote judgment day per se. Instead, it'll be in a spiritual judgment or a, a spiritual hell in which all souls will go who have been wicked. And so it gives them a little bit of leeway to try to redefine some of those things. But ultimately, I wonder if some of it doesn't have to do with the desire not to give up the physical stuff. You know, one of the things that the Sadducees dealt with was their, they, they were wealthy. A lot of, most of the Sadducees were very wealthy. They were the wealthiest sect of the Jews. And they didn't want to imagine a world without their wealth. Because with wealth comes power. It comes control. And there's so many people in our world today that have put so much trust and so much stock in their possessions and their physical uh, wealth. And I wonder if some of these efforts to make heaven on earth, it's kind of trying to have the best of both worlds, literally. To be able to, to have the salvation and that sense of, of paradise that God promises, but also still have my wealth and control and maybe even my prestige or status associated with it. Now, like I said, there's several different ways in which I'm sure that there are motivations to believe in a physical kingdom on earth. But in the end, Paul makes it very clear that one goes with the other. Now, of course, there's millennialists who certainly they do believe in, or most of them believe in a resurrection of the dead. And then at some point, either pre or post, uh, there will be a thousand year reign and so forth on earth. But ultimately, notice what Paul says. He says, This gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, that is, that Christ and him crucified, him resurrected, and him waiting for to return to, to take us to judgment, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you. Well, millennialism pre post however whatever type of variation there is is not that which paul taught and that which christ taught through the apostles the concept of a physical kingdom on earth jesus himself told pilate if my kingdom were physical my servants would fight if my kingdom were of this world i would have a mo i would have an army and we'd fight but it's not of this world in fact, Mormonism even teaches that the church was, uh, wasn't really the intended outcome. Jesus intended to establish a physical kingdom when he came, but to his surprise, the Jews rejected him. And so he came up with the church kind of as a stopgap measure until he could bring about the physical kingdom the way he wanted. None of that's true. None of that is true. And it just goes to show that what we believe is important. It's what we believe is directly related to whether or not we're going to be saved. And we have to make sure we believe what the Bible teaches, not what man teaches. And to that end, make sure we always have our mind on heaven, that spiritual place. Yes, granted, we can't comprehend it because it's beyond our experience. And yet we know it's there. And we believe in the promises of God and what little we have detailed of that place, that home in heaven, it is going to be a place beyond description. All right, that's the devotional for you today. Lord willing, our next devotional will be on Monday. I hope to see you all then. Thank you, everybody.